All right, well, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Um, hope everybody's here. Um, it's going to be uh, we're going to be discussing uh, modernization. And my my name is Mike Cohorst. I'm a senior account manager here at Crossville, and I also have Jonathan Cashman, who is a, a senior account executive. And uh, we have Kitty with um, Cocktail Guru with us. And let me go to the next slide real quick here. Uh, let's see here. All right, so from a agenda standpoint, uh, just uh, the logistics, um, want to make sure everybody has their kits in front of us or in front of them. Um, Kitty will uh, shortly go through, like, make sure you have everything, what kind of drinks we're going to make. We're going to have a couple, we're going to be making three drinks tonight, and we're going to have a couple break um, breaks to do those. Um, so we want to have it uh, be fun and interactive. Um, this uh, event is being recorded, so we'll send the, reco uh, the recording out afterwards. Um, we'll also send the, the PowerPoint that we go through as well. Um, and we'll basically go uh, through who is Crossfell and also the different topics that we're going to cover tonight. Um, why is app modernization important? How, we, how Crossfell can help with enablement? But I also would like to um, give thanks to our partnership with uh, Red Hat. Uh, this wouldn't be possible if uh, we didn't have uh, their support. And also, um, this is maybe our eighth event with Cocktail Guru, and that's who um, Kitty is working for. So, um, shout out to them for their um, partnership. So, with that, um, Kitty, why don't you walk through? Um, yeah, why don't you walk through making sure everybody has everything for the drinks that we're going to make? And then, once you're done with that, we'll go through who Crossfell is. Perfect. Thank you so much. So hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to have so much fun tonight. I'm super excited. Um, my name is Kirsten, but my nickname is Kitty. Um, I was given that nickname by an old manager way back in the day when I was a little baby waitress. So now we're friends. You can call me Kitty um, throughout the <laughs> conversation. <laughs> um, I am a cocktail consultant, brand ambassador, bartender, and cocktail guru. I've been on that team for about um, seven years now. So super, super fun. Um, you'll want to make sure. So if you're working with the kit tonight, you'll want to make sure that you grabbed everything out of your kit. Um, so go ahead and check the crinkles in case anything might have fallen through because there's a few little small packets. Um, but we're going to do three different drinks tonight and three different styles. So we're going to learn a ton about cocktail pro tips um, and how to make some classic style drinks. So the first drink is going to be um, a sour style cocktail called the Luck of the Irish. <clears throat> we're also going to make an Irish mule, which is like a mule kind of highball style cocktail made with ginger beer and a little twist on that with some apple cider. And we're also going to make an Irish coffee variation, which is a super fun cocktail. And we can talk about the history of the Irish coffee at the end, too. Um, so you'll definitely want to go through. So the, for the drinks, you will want to make sure that you have um, your juices. And I'll talk through this before we go, eat, go through each drink. But you'll want to make sure you have your fresh citrus. Um, there's simple syrup that came in the packet. Uh, these two little canisters. So we have some ginger beer and some cider. Uh, there's a really cute package with the garnish and all the stuff that you'll need to garnish the cocktails in it. And then finally, we have a um, like a little powder version of the coffee and then a powder version of the coconut cream. More importantly than any of that stuff, you're going to want to make sure you grab your alcohol, right? <laughs> Um, so we have two drinks that we're going to mix with whiskey. So you'll go ahead and grab an Irish whiskey if you were able to uh, purchase some of that or bring some of that to the set. If you don't, anything is fine. So any type of whiskey that you like to mix with. Um, the first drink that we do is going to be made with a spirit of your choice. So I'm going to work with gin for that cocktail. Um, and then for the build, so the builds of these cocktails are pretty straightforward and it's going to be so much fun to teach you basics of bartending with these cocktails because of the way we make them. So you'll want to make sure that you have your cocktail shaker. So I have one that looks like this, which is two pieces. This is kind of like a beloved bartender cocktail shaker. We love using these and I, I'll talk a little bit more about why. Uh, but you might have one that looks a little bit more like this at home so feel free to grab this type of shaker if you don't have that you can use anything you could use a mason jar um you could use even like a tupperware like any port in a storm really like maybe one of those cups that you use to shake a sports drink something like that um, if you're working with a separated shaker you want to make sure that you have a strainer too and if you forget anything don't worry we'll go over this with each drink as well um, and then something to measure your drink with, right? So I have two styles of jigger, we call them jiggers. So that's something that's fixed in the middle like this. It's two little cones. 
Um, or you could also work with like a tiny measuring cup, which is what I have, or something like a tablespoon. We can work with tablespoons as well. And I can talk you through how to measure your drinks through that. Um, and then from there, you might want a little spoon because we're gonna be stirring up our coffee later. So our last drink we're gonna stir with um, something. And then of course, you also wanna make sure that you have your glassware. So you wanna make sure that you have a rocks glass for the first drink. And again, I'll go over everything as we approach the drinks as well. So if you forget something, don't worry. You'll also wanna have a Collins glass, so something like this. And if you don't have one of these at home, you could always work with like a pint glass, another rocks glass, really any port in a storm. We're just having fun with these cocktails. And then finally, so this is kind of important for the last drink, you'll wanna grab something that you can make the hot cocktail in. Um, so I have a cute little mug here. Um, but I'm also gonna, I'm gonna try to build mine in this mason jar because that way you'll be able to see the drink as we're making it. Um, so I think that's it for my side. We'll definitely go over everything. Oh, and one more thing from the top. So you can do this a little bit later in the presentation or you can go and start it going, uh, get it going now. We're gonna need hot water towards the end for our last cocktail. So you could either go and put some water to boil on the stove or you could put some in the microwave and heat up some hot water for our last drink that we're gonna make for our final drink. I think that's everything to get us going. Wonderful. So I hope, hope everyone has their kits and uh, the supplies that Kitty uh, discussed. And again, we're gonna be making three drinks. We'll have some, we wanna keep this interactive. We wanna make it fun. Obviously it's um, in lieu of uh, St. Patrick's Day coming up and uh, being in a Irish founded company, uh, there's a lot of heritage for us um, in St. Patrick's Day here at Crossville. So with that, um, we're going to go in and dive uh, into who's Crossvale. Let me go to the next, hopefully. All right, just a little levity before we start. I always like to, um, as everyone knows, like through the evolution of different um, buzzwords, like, you know, first it was way back, you know, two decades ago, it was cloud. Everything's going to the cloud. Nobody knows what that means. Next, it's like, we're going to virtualize everything. So now the, the buzzword is like, we're going to containerize. So this, you know, comic uh, strip from Dilbert um, sums up maybe some conversations you've had internally at your organizations, you know, basically, you know, I need to know why moving our app to the cloud didn't automatically solve our problem. Um, well, and then, you know, you wouldn't let me re-architect re it, um, the app uh, to be cloud native. And then his boss is like, just put it in containers. You know, you can't solve a problem by just saying techie things. And then he shouts out Kubernetes. So I'm sure <laughs> everybody can kind of relate to this in the sense of it's not just um, giving it lip service and whatnot. So hopefully today we can give you some thoughts of where you're at in the journey. Mm -hmm. We're going to ask some polling questions. We want to keep this interactive. Actually, there's um, yeah. right now, uh, Laura just put one out there as far as making sure everyone has their kits. So go ahead and respond to that. That way we can um, make sure that you get the necessary uh, kit afterwards. So, all right, let's slide forward. All right. Um, a little bit about uh, Crossville. We were founded in 2001 where our headquarters is in Dallas. Um, we came out of the um, application development practice. Uh, we have offices in EMEA in uh, North America. We also have a managed service uh, practice for OpenShift in Spain. So really what we cover is we're an IT service provider. We cover these four main buckets of um, or pillars, you can call them. Uh, we do subscriptions, um, both Red Hat and other products, but primarily Red Hat. Uh, we do the day zero consulting. So basically we will come in and access, like, you know, we'll do a statement to work and that's through assessments and we plan. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, at the end around um, enablement and assessments. From that, we give, delivered a uh, statement of work and that's at day one uh, design and build phase with our consulting services. And, service. and then last, go ahead. Is there a question or? And then uh, lastly is the um, 
the last pillar is uh, managed services. So uh, that day two uh, maintaining and um, compliance. So a lot of um, companies that we deal with, they go out, they set out, you know, they start deploying this and then they get to the point of like, they, um, as far as the resource needed to maintain it and do the daily maintenance, um, they don't want to do that or have the expertise. And so that's where we come in and can help provide a managed uh, service solution for you as well. Uh, let's see what's okay. There's still a poll question here. All right, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so here's some accolades. Um, basically, uh, we've been partner of the uh, year for the last um, five years uh, with Red Hat. Uh, we're also AWS uh, certified in all the, the different various um, clouds. Uh, Microsoft Gold Partner, Google Cloud Platform. So that's a little bit uh, some of our accolades. Let's see what we have next. All right, so at this point, uh, I'll turn it back over to Kitty and Kitty, we can um, hear from you as uh, for our first drink. Get to mixing, awesome. Okay, so for folks that are working with the cocktail card, um, we're gonna start, we're gonna work on the card from what's on the left to the right. So we're gonna start with the first drink, which is the Luck of the Irish. So you wanna go ahead and grab your shaker and get that ready to go. So for this drink, a um, little bit of a bartender pro tip. We're gonna work on some, some fun bartender pro tips. One is building the drink in the shaker. Um, and then also there's a sort of a little uh, unspoken practice, I think, in bars with bartenders where they're gonna work on building the drink with the cheapest or smallest ingredient first, right? Um, I'm gonna use that technique today because the first drink that we're using to make our cocktail, or the first ingredient we're using to make our cocktail is this little packet of matcha. And we wanna make sure that it dissolves before we start adding the ice into the cocktail shaker. So go ahead and grab whatever you're shaking in. And then we'll find our little green packet of the matcha tea. Go ahead and toss this into your shaker tin. Matcha's like definitely been having a moment for the past like probably decade. There might be folks here. If you have a matcha tea every morning, tell me because I would love to hear about how much you love it. So go ahead and add your matcha. Um, we're basically building this drink from the bottom up. That's how you can think about it. Uh, so from here, we're gonna grab our simple syrup. So the simple syrup is this little container. Now simple syrup is really just equal parts sugar and water. But because our kit is so convenient, we've gone ahead and sent you stuff where that's already made. But this is something that you could totally easily make at home. Um, it's something that I make at least once a week for myself because I love having fresh cocktails at home. And this is a really good example of why you should mix with fresh ingredients at home because this drink is going to taste so good and so balanced made with a simple syrup that um, you go ahead and make by yourself versus, I don't know what, sour mix from a gun, right? Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll grab our simple syrup. And then you can find your jigger. So I'm using one of these little measuring cups that I love. Um, the measure for this, for the simple syrup is gonna be three quarters of an ounce. Go ahead and pour that into your container. And then if you remember nothing else from today, <laughs> The formula I'm about to share with you as we go through this cocktail is a great thing to keep in your back pocket. Uh, so the matcha aside, we've started with our three quarters of an ounce of our sugar syrup or our simple syrup. Um, the next ingredient is going to be our lemon juice. So what is really cool about the products that we sent today is that this juice is actually fresh juice that has already been, um, it's been juiced and stabilized for you. Um, it's gonna taste totally different than if you were to use something like one of those little lemons that you buy at the liquor store. Now I say any port in a storm for sure, um, but if you can fresh squeeze your juice or come across something like this cheeky brand of juice, it's gonna make, make your cocktail taste so delicious. Uh, so for this one, we're gonna match the level of sweetness with the level of sour. And that's kind of what is making this drink a sour style cocktail. So we did three quarters of our sweet. We're gonna go ahead and add three quarters of our sour. Right, and this could be where you stopped if you were doing like a mocktail. You could even just add like some club soda and some ice and have this call it a day. But we're gonna add booze today. 
Um, so the final little part is going to be our strong, right? So we did our sweet, we did our sour, and now we're doing our strong. And again, I'm working with gin because I absolutely love gin. Laura, I know gin is huge in Spain, so fun. Um, but you folks can go ahead and use anything you want. If you wanted to use like a whiskey, vodka, whatever makes your heart sing. Two ounces of our strong. So the formula for a basic, like really good classic sour structure is two of the strong, three quarters of the sweet, and three quarters of the sour. Okay, so because we're using that matcha, and I'm not sure, I just want to make sure it's dissolved in my cup. I'm going to go ahead and grab a spoon and go ahead and give this a stir. Something else you could do if you don't have a spoon is close it up and give it a little shake with nothing in it. It's just to make sure that we're dissolved. Okay, mine is looking pretty good. Any questions so far before we add the ice? I think you guys are doing great. Um, the Another interesting thing, and just to, in case you're wondering why I built this without the ice in the glass already, is because, again, bartender pro tips. So say, for example, you're working in the bar and a guest comes up to you and wants to cash out their check or the chef wants you to run some food, something like that. If I had built this in the shaker tin with the ice, it would be diluting while I ran around and did all that other stuff, right? Multitasking. So this is a good tip. And this, I mean, honestly, it's a bartender tip, but it's something that'll totally apply to you at home. Like if you have little kids running around or maybe the phone rings, you're busy, something like that. So when you're ready, you're gonna use, you're gonna grab your ice. The loudest part of our presentation. <laughs> and shake together, which is so much fun. I'm of the age that I grew up, for some reason, my parents let me watch that movie Cocktail when I was a little kid, so maybe you folks saw that one too. Um, basically for this drink, when you're shaking, you wanna think about using a lot of ice, right? So I think one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're making cocktails is not buying or bringing enough ice with them. So think about filling your tin about half to three quarters full of your ice, and then I'm gonna go ahead and put the top tin on top, right? So I have a little more work to do with mine. If you have a cobbler shaker, you're just gonna close it. And then at the end, you're gonna strain it off. I'll show you how to do it with the Boston shaker. So the Boston shaker, now it's closed. I get a nice firm tap and I can tell that it's sealed just by how tense it is. And then I'm just trying to, what we like to say with the cocktail guru is that we're trying to shake our cocktail to wake it up, not to put it to sleep. So while you're shaking, you're thinking about tossing that ice from the back end of the cocktail shaker to the front end of the cocktail. So really just getting into it. Go ahead, put your elbows into it. <laughs> I think that's a song. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's a hip hop song for sure. So I think the tech, like the, the science of how long to shake is Definitely, it's not a scientific thing. I did go to a class about it once. It was the nerdiest thing and I felt like I learned nothing. So basically I say shake till your hands are really cold. Um, the more you mix cocktails, the more you work with drinks over time, you'll start to kind of get a sense. You can actually kind of hear and feel when the ice is starting to dilute. So mine is done. Now you could do one of two things here. You can go ahead and just pour the ice and the cocktail into your cocktail lot. But because I love you all, I'm gonna show you how to pour over fresh ice or new ice. So basically what that means is that I'm gonna have fresh new ice in my glass, and it means the cubes are gonna melt less fast, right? So from here, I'm gonna grab my strainer. I'm working with a strainer. You just place it over the top. There's this, this is called a Hawthorne strainer. There's this little spring that'll fit right inside. I'm gonna hold on to the top of it with my hand. So my hand goes on the bottom part of the shaker, and then my uh, pointer finger on top Nice firm grip. If you're at home going like this, no points deducted, right? As long as you get the drink off the off the ice, you're in good shape. And then from here, ooh, look at that color. I'm gonna go ahead and strain. So Kitty, it's so amazing how much, like you mentioned the ice and having it melt out affects the, the taste of the alcohol. I mean, like if I have a bourbon and put it just a big, uh, block of ice in there and let it you know sit and soak for a little bit for me yeah. that's what I prefer but some people like it neat but it does change yeah. the the flavor quite a bit when the ice melts 
Oh, absolutely. It's so, so interesting how it affects alcohol. Um, and then with cocktails, it's like a little bit of a balance, right? Because you do want it to be diluted. One of the key ingredients in the cocktail is actually water. But if it's over diluted, then it's just that, right? Yeah. Uh, so from here, yep. the final ingredient is our little garnish. You're just going to go ahead and place your citrus wheel on top. And then we'll say cheers. Give it a taste. It looks wonderful. Hopefully everybody right. was able to uh, follow along and make that. And um, I don't know if I if you have three of these throughout this presentation, we might not remember it, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, um, well, thanks, Kitty, for that. Um, so just uh, before we maybe start the presentation, we have a couple um, polling questions to uh, we just kind of want to get the lay of the land where everybody's at in their journey. And so um, with that, you'll see a couple of questions if you guys can respond and um basically i think the first one out there is um are you guys getting requests for app modernization so this might be more for you know obviously in the the infrastructure side of the house um or the actually or the development side of the house but yep so um mike do you want to go to that next slide Sure, I can do that while we're uh, throwing some of these questions up here. And yeah. You see, there you go. Great, great. As as Mike said in the beginning, my name is Jonathan Cashman. Uh, I, we work together at Crossvale. Um, I'm, a, I'm a senior account executive here. And so we're talking about application modernization. And when we when we do, we, we kind of think of it as a process that improves software delivery performance for businesses by updating rather than replacing right so we're updating uh old older legacy software systems um and so for many organizations it involves it involves replatforming existing legacy workloads onto modern cloud platforms um based on kubernetes breaking monolithic applications into smaller pieces like microservices right so um we're kind of talking about some common ways and and reasons why to modernize so the the first um the first question here is uh, why I'm going to get this all out of my away from my screen here, so I can read it. But why modernize legacy applications? So normally when we do these kinds of things, people don't normally say anything, right? So uh, I'd love to get some interaction. Uh, Darren Laurie, I see you on here. Maybe you can help me out. Um, uh, could somebody could somebody chime in as to like why uh, modern modernizing uh, legacy apps is so important right now? Gain more better performance out of your application. Better performance for sure. Most of you guys are pros on here. I'm sure maybe this is a little little benign for you, but uh, anyone else? What I, what I hear a lot from my customers. Which one? Moving off old hardware to uh, virtualized systems in the cloud. I was just going to mention that the one I hear from a lot of my customers is that you just to keep pace with their competitors, right? If they're not um, going to modernize and uh, their competitors are modernizing and gaining market share. So that's part of it as well. Faster, stronger, bigger. Yep. But anyone else want to jump in? We've had a, a couple of drinks already, right? Or one. <laughs> How about stress? Anyone have team stress um, with with their legacy of the apps, or um, anyone want to talk about a, a testimony they've got going on now? Old harder failing, and trying to bring it back up, get parts for the old hardware. It kind of stuck. He's a lot most of the time. You can't replace the hardware. You need something. Replace it. That's a, that's a good point. I mean, I think a lot of times too, you lose the um, I mean, the resource that was responsible for yeah. ma maintaining that application. So um, it, it gets stuck in time. Mm -hmm. Good. Right, so let's go to the next one. Uh, so what are the key technologies for application modernization? Anyone want to jump on that one? Now, obviously, we talk about Kubernetes, right? But what about what about like APIs? Maybe it's because you're all on mute. 
<laughs> I will jump to the next one. Unless Darren, you want to answer that one too. <laughs> um, modern, modern, modernizing for the new versions of Java and .NET applications. That's right. So that way you can really move move the application into the future and to bigger hardware, better, uh, uh, well, better containers or systems that you're going to run this software on. Yep, it's good. Uh, so uh, what is your Red Hat's approach to application modernization? Um, you know, we're we're sort of Red Hat facing as a company. Uh, we're we're the, the top delivery company for Red Hat uh, for three years running. Um, we, we do get quite a bit of the delivery services uh, for them. Uh, anyone want to tackle that one? What is Red Hat's approach to application modernization? Open shift everything. <laughs> there you go. Ding, 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 ding. Open ding. shift all the time. Yeah. That's right. Sprin That's right. Sprinkle in some Ansible, too. There you go. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm seeing some comments there. Yeah. Right. Open shift, open shift, open shift. All right. All right. So, lastly, what's your challenge? Let's let's talk here a little bit. So, the Java application modernization, .NET application modernization, virtualization, ongoing app dev maintenance. Um, anyone want to talk about what their challenges are currently? Having appropriate dev and test environments for the production environments so that you can apply changes in dev and test before you push them into production. It's good. Yep. A good yep. pipeline. A proper dev test. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good CI CD pipeline. Um, anyone else? It's good. Thanks, Darren. Like just get to the booze, all right? <laughs> all right. So that's good. Little, we'll thanks, the thanks for the, yeah. Thanks, Dan. Slide. Thanks for all the help. Yeah. Yep. Let's see here. Let's go to the next slide here. All right. Go ahead, Dante. If you want to yeah, yeah. walk through some. So this of these. is kind of answering some of the stuff that we're already talking about, right? Reducing team stress. So, um, you know, modernization helps to support greater velocity and agility. That's a big word these days, right? Um, to protect investments, refresh software portfolios, to stay competitive, keep costs low, right? Big one. Um, reduce maintenance time and take advantage of contemporary infrastructure tools, languages, and other technology yeah. progress. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you guys can can relate. So, I think the big one good. too is like um, people always say that you know you spend seventy percent of your time doing maintenance type activities and thirty percent doing innovative activities. So yeah. obviously the company would like to see you flip that ratio. So you're doing more innovative and less maintenance and hopefully through modernizing you're you're innovating and not, you know, spending so much time doing some maintenance uh, activities. Yeah. All right. All right we got a we'll comment here. Slide. So well, hold on one second. there's a comment from uh, from Philip applications that still require dated technology, lack of understanding about containers. That leads to concerted, yes, security concerns and fear of change. Yes, absolutely. We deal with a lot of these, Philip. Um, you know, you've got two, we always kind of think about it in two ways, right? So this is what this technology does, right? It'll do all these things. But the the reality is, how do I get all that goodness <laughs> to work for me? And there's a lot of, you know, human problems that come into it, like, you know, it, you know, fear of change is a big one, right? It, it, am I gonna am I gonna harm? Am I gonna cause more harm than good? Is this gonna not work? Am I gonna, you know, be looked at as like breaking something, or am I gonna lose my job over this even? Um, so, uh, for sure. And then security concerns are are a real big one. So making sure that best practices are in place is is sort of kind of where we live. Uh, we do a lot of POCs, right, to sort of answer these kinds of things, uh, uh, to prove the concept of uh, the modern, the modern, the modernizing uh, technique, right? So we'll take a a, sand, a sandbox of OpenShift and build something, right? Put a workload on it, and you know, put in a test environment and make sure that the security um, features are, you know, in pl in place, or or uh, that the compliance um, is going to be met. Or there's a lot of different um, uh, what we would consider uh, use cases for it. But yeah, for sure. Thanks, Philip. Thanks for jumping in on that.
So we have a, a large fintech practice, and so security is well, it's a concern for everybody, but especially the uh, financial industry. So we have, like uh, Jonathan mentioned, we do best practices, right? So a lot of people do a hybrid approach. You maybe you know, or keep it on premise, knowing that your data that you're interacting with is maybe with a very sensitive data, and then you know, exposing only what is necessary. Or um, and those are some of the things that we can help um, companies through. You know, to go through what is a container, what it, what can it do? You know, and it meets very different things to the infrastructure team as it does the development team. So. Good. Let's take the next one here. All right, Jonathan, you can walk through some of these success criteria that we've seen, uh, like proven. Yeah, sure. So, so eight steps of cloud native application success. So, evolve a DevOps culture and practices, and take advantage of new technology. Right, speed up existing monolithic applications by either migrating a container-based platform and, or migrating and then breaking applications into microservices and mini services. Um, use application services middleware to speed up the development of business logic using a container-based application platform that supports the right mix of frameworks, languages, and architectures, provide self-service on-demand infrastructure for developers, automate IT to accelerate application delivery with automation, implement continuous delivery and advanced deployment techniques, and evolve a more modular architecture by choosing a design that makes sense for your specific needs. So these are, uh, I mean, these vary, but the, the themes are uh, similar across uh, success criteria. I think one that's important is um, having that leadership from the top down. So if your leadership doesn't back this, um, in my previous life, uh, I worked for a construction company and they were I always say, we're not an IT company. Well, today, every, but every company is an IT company because it's the backbone of your business. So. Um, so it, it needs the support from the top down to, and, and it is a change process basically. And as um, Jonathan just mentioned, so. Yep. All right, so let's see, I believe with that, so we're gonna go back and get our second drink uh, with Kitty. Okay, I'm excited. So now we're getting into our Irish whiskey. So for this next drink, you're going to want to make sure that you have this one is so great. We're going to build this one in the glass. Um, so I have what I have a vintage. I have like all vintage cocktail glasses. That's like my favorite thing in the world. Um, but what I have is basically like a Collins glass. So um, you can grab one of these. But if you don't have one of those, you can also just go ahead and grab a rocks glass. Um, and we're going to build this cocktail. It's super, super simple. Built in the glass is so easy and fun because you can just build it and then start drinking. Um, so I'm working with my, we'll start with our strong first on this cocktail. So we're going to go ahead and grab two ounces of our Irish whiskey. Um, and I have a different digger I'm using this time. So this one I happen to know is two ounces on top and one ounce on the bottom. Go ahead and measure that out and pour it right into your glass. Maybe a little on the table like I just did. <laughs> um, and then we're going to work with half an ounce of, again, this cheeky lime juice. Um, so again, I can't stress enough how great it is to work with fresh juice in cocktails. And then again, I'm just using the big bowl of my jigger. So you just kind of eyeball, right? So I know um, I can figure out just by looking at it about, about what half an ounce is going to be in here. And then I'm going to go ahead and add my ice now. And the reason is because once you start to add the carbonated stuff, which I'm going to be working with in just a minute, um, it could kind of get a little messy and froth all over the glass. So I'm going to go ahead and add my ice. And with the ice on this one, you'll need to just go ahead and add it right to the tippy top. Okay. And then, last little part. It's equal parts ginger beer and sparkling apple cider. So I'm basically just gonna eyeball this one. I know I was really strict about measuring everything in the beginning, but at some point with cocktails, it's fun to just measure with your heart, right? So we'll go ahead and we're gonna do about half the balance with my ginger beer. And then I'm gonna do half the balance 
with my fizzy apple cider. And this sounds to me like it would do really well as a mocktail too. Okay, so once I've built it in the glass, already nice and frothy, just gonna grab my, I have a spoon straw, right? So you can go ahead and grab a straw if you have one. Um, or you can use like a chopstick or any type of spoon just to combine, slide it on the edge of the glass and give it a gentle stir to combine. So super simple cocktail. And then for the garnish for this one, we're gonna work with our cinnamon stick. I think it, I can't, it doesn't say cinnamon stick. It says St. Patrick's Day candy. If you've got a cinnamon stick, I'm gonna say you should use it. I think that would be a nice garnish here. You just go ahead and slide that over the top. And then we have these cute little candies here too. And I might just put that on the side for my drink. Okay. So once again, with the cocktail guru, we like to say we, we drink with our eyes first. So the garnish is always, um, you know, something to think about when you're building a drink. But it's also something that can add a ton of flavor to your cocktail, right? So if you did go ahead and work with a cinnamon stick, you can slide it on the side. 80% of what we perceive of as taste is actually smell. So that cinnamon is gonna tie everything together and give you lots of kind of like fall, like wintry flavors, making this a little bit more complex than just a cocktail that's like ginger beer with Irish whiskey. Let's give it a stir, give it a sip. Oh, so good. This is something I think would go down really, really easy and be perfect to serve at like a big St. Patrick's Day Irish party if you're having one uh, coming up. Cheers. So you're saying make it in batches. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to be so bold as to say that this one is a forgiving recipe too. So I feel like if the night wore on and you were making them a few hours later and you didn't want to jigger, you might be in okay shape. <laughs> Sounds great. Cheers. All right. So hopefully everybody was able to follow along and make those. If I don't know if you were done with the first one to start the second one, but uh, cheers. All right. So let's um, do we have a, a follow up question, um, Jonathan, or there do we go to the well, next group? We, we can go to the next one. We, we should uh, probably just hit the, the polls uh, soon. OK. Uh, th this next poll question is, do you understand or have a process for modernization? And we kind of hit those maybe at the end. Yeah. Thanks, Kitty. Yeah, wonderful. All right, let's jump to the next. All right. What we we wanted to talk about is knowing that it, um, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, the app modernization, it affects many parts of the organization, right? Not only infrastructure, but uh, the development side of the house, right? So these are just a, a couple, you know, modernization readiness uh, topics that, um, you know, we um, discuss with our clients. Uh, we always talk about automation, right? Try to drive out uh, repetitive tasks, cut costs, you know, reduce error, that type of thing. And as uh, companies start trying to, uh, we heard it mentioned tonight, if you have old hardware, do we refresh? You know, is it, you know, time to, everybody's virtualized, uh, hopefully some of their workloads, are we putting that on-prem in the cloud, depending where the sensitive data is? So that's a topic. And, and as you're going down this app modernization is, where do you want the app to run next close to the data? Is it you know secure? Uh, that's been brought up a couple of times, right? So the last you know uh, the software development life cycle is like you know we're basically breaking down these monolithic apps and you know um, doing it so that uh, it's more agile and you can um, bring out new features quicker and. Um, that's really kind of the readiness stage of uh, where you guys might be in this journey. And we'll discuss a little bit how we can help um, get you guys along the way. So when taking a look at uh, some of your legacy apps, you know, there's really, uh, if you take a look in the, the front, you know, there's the assessment you analyze, right? Once you take a look at the applications you're running, you really have these three uh, things in the middle that you you can either re-engineer it, 
you can migrate it or you replace it. So I have a um, large insurance company that is currently running off a mainframe. They have an old um, app written in COBOL, and basically that's been around since 1960, right? So there's not a lot of people out there still coding in COBOL. So they wanted at first they were going to re-engineer this uh, application and they weren't finding uh, enough uh, resources to be able to understand the COBOL, translate that to a Java application. So now they've decided to basically replace that application with a, a new one and then basically bring it in-house and do a, uh, you know, get a minimal viable product, MVP product running so that they can test it internally to see if that's going to meet their needs. And we can help you with this journey. But that's some of the things that, you know, as you're looking at your applications and maybe, you know, uh, for like Jonathan said, for a POC, we just go after the low hanging fruit and, you know, maybe take one of those and show you what a container can do, right? Because there was a question earlier about not understanding what a container is and how to do that. Um, I'm just curious, do a lot of people, as have a lot of people like done the path of uh, DYI, you know, do it yourself and stand up a container and, turn, and start to experiment? Uh, I know that wasn't one of our poll questions, but I just was thinking in my head that I see a lot of that as well, where people or companies go down a path of doing it themselves. They get to an end state and they're like, uh, this is too difficult. So we do uh, come across that quite a bit. Jonathan, any comments around this? Yeah, anyone, anyone wanna jump in on that? Are people going through this process right now of taking a look at their apps to either re-engineer, uh, re-engineer, migrate them, or totally yeah? I mean, there was them? a poll. There was a poll uh, question: Are you getting uh, requests now? And seventy-one percent said yes. So, um, and then have you taken monolithic applications and converted them to agile? Half said yes, half said no. So, um, <laughs> at least half of you guys are are. I'm I'm, I'm assuming you know those numbers overlap. You know, you guys are getting requests for modernization, um, and and maybe you guys have some some needs right now um, to to modernize. Um, you know, that's sort of like where we live, right? That's kind of why we're here uh, doing this event is to kind of help help you guys kind of get to the next stage of things and kind of get a plan in place. Um, but but does anyone want to talk about their frustrations with um, uh, their monolithic applications conversions? I'm opening the floor, but all right. That's what, that's why we went to the polling questions because it's uh, I know yeah. doing a lot of these that uh, polling tends to be a little uh, easier, I think. Um, right. Well, just as Jonathan stated, I mean we have a, a strong application background. That's how Crosswell is founded. So we take that. Uh, best practice, and we are able to combine that with, um, you know, the the platform piece of it as well. So, the next uh, piece. Uh, let's see. Wait, we're missing. Whoops! I guess we're going back. Well, one of the. Um, let me go back here if I can. Whoops. Let's go. My bad. All right. One of the uh, ways that we uh, help is through an assessment. Um, so when we typically engage with an assessment, we go through analyzing, you know, where you guys are at today and where you want to be. And from that, we can do, that's what this next slide covers basically, is uh, an outcome. This is, I just took a slide for one of our engagements that we just recently did. This was around the infrastructure. Um, and I pulled this one up because the, the audience um, mainly it looked like was from the infrastructure side of the house, but we touch all different aspects of the application, right? Not only from the infrastructure, from the development side of the house. And we um, basically through this, it can be a two week assessment where we schedule meetings with your various uh, teams and we ask them a bunch of questions. And for instance, on the infrastructure side, we covered uh, mainly broke it down in these four categories, right? And so this was just a visual representation of where they're at. So like for instance, the environmental uh, environment segmentation for this particular customer was low. 
So that that's an area for them to work at, right? So they didn't have a lot of um, you know high availability or DR capabilities. Um, so you know th those are some of the, the things that came out from the infrastructure group. But we also um, you know we go very deep inside of each of these, and these assessments um, are very helpful because it gives you a roadmap of how to get to the next phase. So this is just a example of. Uh, just a portion of that. Um, I don't know if we want to maybe just uh, pause here. I know we have, uh, let's see, it's uh, 17 after. I don't know if we want to go back to Kitty and maybe make the third drink and then um, Jonathan and I can wrap up on the, the few couple slides that we have left. That's awesome. So the last drink is so fun. It's going to be an Irish coffee. So this one is so, so simple. Um, if I could have used chance, one of those this morning. <laughs> I know. I should right? start out with that one. <laughs> yeah. well, it's you can put whiskey in the coffee. It's like a total game changer. So um, if you're well, well, just, what's that? <laughs> so what I learned during COVID is uh, when you do have whiskey in your coffee glass, you're supposed to blow on it to make sure, you know, when you're on camera, it looks like you're cooling it off. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Ooh, that sounds like a bartender trick. Did you bartend? <laughs> no. Oh, that's awesome. So this one is going to be another just build it in the glass. And I can share a little bit about the Irish whiskey or the Irish coffee afterwards. Just want to make sure we're respectful of everybody's time. Um, but do go ahead and grab some hot water if you haven't already. And you'll be able to catch up to us at the end. Um, so basically, we're going to build this one with our two ounces of Irish whiskey again. And I'm going to build it in my do mason you, jar. I'm just going to see what happens. Do you have a preference on Irish whiskey? Yeah, sure. So this one, thank you for asking. This one is actually, I went ahead, my friend works for this company. So he runs the brand. He's a partial owner. This one's called Glendalock. Um, and they were actually the first craft distillery to open up in Ireland. Um, so they're a modern distillery. I think it opened in 2007. Yeah. So Irish whiskey history is totally fascinating. The industry almost died like after prohibition, after World War II, like it really got narrowed down from hundreds of distilleries to maybe two or three. So, but the good news is that there's been tons of innovation in Irish whiskey in the past few years. You might know something called the Celtic Tiger. So lots of innovation and a booming economy over in Ireland. Um, so we're seeing lots of cool brands coming to market. But if you wanna try a new one, definitely try Glendalock. But also, you know, there's the classic brands like Jameson, of course, is always good. Redbreast is an incredible Irish whiskey, especially if you want a sipper. Um, but definitely, if you want to just try different whiskeys, then Irish whiskey is a cool category. Um, so the, the big yeah. one here in Minnesota, where I'm located, is Two Gingers. Uh, so oh. there's a, a restaurant chain here in Minnesota, and they were the number one seller at Jamison, I guess. And then the owner uh, founded Two Gingers Whiskey. Uh, he's from Ireland. So uh, cool. if you haven't tried it, I recommend Two Gingers as well. Yes, I know that whiskey. That's amazing. I didn't know that it was related to a, um, a whiskey or a restaurant chain. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, so two ounces of our Irish whiskey. And then it's so, so easy. We're just going to go ahead and add about a cup of the coffee. So the coffee packet that you have, you want to make one packet to eight ounces, which I actually went ahead and did beforehand. I mean, depending on the day, you might do a shorter pour of the coffee. If you wanted to have a little party. <laughs> um. And then we're just going to add our coconut milk creamer, which is vanilla flavored right here. Katie, we had a question about two gingers. Sure. What is two gingers? I don't know. Mike, is that the owners? Two gingers is the name of the, or I bet it was named after two yeah. redheaded Irish folks. Yeah. Yeah. Am I it's two gingers. Irish people? It's just a, <laughs> no, it's a uh, two ginger whiskey. Was Yes, the, the name yeah, that is the name of the whiskey. Yes. Yeah. So um, cool. So go ahead and open up your packet, which I'm having a little trouble doing. Let me step off and grab a knife. Folks, open your packet. Do better than I did. <laughs> um, but I love actually, there's so many parallels between what you're sharing with your presentation and like what we what I think about the cocktails, right? So this is like a classic cocktail. The Irish uh, coffee goes back to like the 1920s and the birth of aviation. So this cocktail is actually like uh, 
Legacy. Reconfiguration of a very classic legacy. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll add. And then just give it a little stir. So nothing could be easier than this cocktail, right? This is something you could make early in the morning, into the afternoon. <laughs> go ahead, give it a little stir. And it's got modern ingredients too, right? So it has a coconut creamer, um, which is interesting as well. So it's like old Ireland, new Ireland all together. Something that a good healthy stir, just making sure it's all dissolved. And we'll go ahead and give a little taste. Cheers. I mean, look out Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, the flavors combine really, really nicely. Yeah, so it's definitely um, got that sweetness that you'd want to have in your Irish coffee. Um, usually when you make Irish coffee classically, you'd put a little bit of sugar in the bottom with some water and then melt your coffee and melt it with your coffee. So cheers. Nice. Well, yeah. cheers. Thank you. All right. Um, hopefully everybody was able to follow along on that and Kind of wrapping up, uh, we just have, I think, a, a few different or two slides left. Um, I don't know, uh, Jonathan, if you kind of want to walk through a couple of ways we can help enable customers. I know there's been a lot of questions and comments about not understanding, um, you know, uh, where they're at in the process, maybe, or what containers can do and how we can help uh, with those um, various aspects with these um, clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, do we have one last poll question, Lauren? Or no? Yeah, I'm mute. Are, are the polls done? Yeah, the last one was, um, do you understand how a process of modernization? And then just a follow-up question if, if people yeah. want to follow up. Yeah, yeah. We can add well, that as I'll well. Maybe just I'll hit that last. Um, what Mike okay. has up here, this slide is on our, our managed service product. So it's what we call it workload excellence as a service. It's basically um, a 24 7 365 support uh, service that we offer. Um, it comes with about 27 hours of uh, a month of mentorship. So what we say is we want to get you zero to confident um, within, you know, within the year, right? So where you're able to do, um, you're able to design, enable, build, configure, you know, all of your um, your own workloads and 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 move them and and so and whatever your kind of platform issues you um, you have, we can kind of uh, we can sort of customize the MSP for that. But anyway, the idea is that um, your subscriptions would come. Um, it's on that platform, and then. Um, you scale on demand, you run anywhere on prem, public cloud, SaaS, um, the app deployment uh, support with dynamic uh, platform tuning. Uh, dynamic tuning is a big deal because you know you could have OpenShift, but really maybe your clusters are only running 30%, right? And that's scaled out. It could be, you know, you're not optimizing, you know, your subscriptions. Um, run hybrid if needed, uh, DR and backup, no SMEs needed for you to, to, de uh, to develop. And it's starting around twelve nine a month. Um, so compare that to actually hiring a, a high end IT person to kind of do that work for you. It's a whole lot cheaper, especially with benefits these days. Um, but Mike, yeah, do you want to go to the next slide? Sure. So this is our last. Uh, this is our last slide. So let's partner together. So this is how we can help you. So. Um, we asked, you know, a lot of questions along the way um, about, uh, you know, your monitor, where you are in your monitor, uh, modernizing journey, I could say. Um, so what we do is we do assessments, we do scoping calls um, to sort of, you know, sort of like a Q&A, right? Um, we do, uh, and also we, we can get you uh, a funded POC. So something that uh, we can build for you in your environment that you can play with and, you know, we can see how it works. And then um, uh, an expert call, basically, to kind of discuss best practices. So, with that, this last poll question is: Would you like us to follow up with you to discuss best practices? I'll say yes. Um, so, 
what we could do is after this is kind of follow up with you, right? And so we want to kind of, we, we're here to assist you wherever you are in your journey. So whether it be through an assessment, a scoping call, or a POC, or an expert call, um, you know, we're here to help you. So utilize us. Um, it won't cost anything, obviously, to just kind of talk with us um, around best practices. But what I typically do is um, I'll book like a solutions architect to sort of uh, sit with you for a half hour, an hour to kind of discuss where you are in your journey and and see where you where you need to go, um, you know where you're you're feeling the pain, and uh, see what we can do to help you kind of move from from that place of pain to to change. Right. Um, my contact information is below. Um, that's probably the easiest way. Jay Cashman at crossfail dot com. Um, I'll, I'll we'll be reaching out again. I'll send a follow up email. But if you if you guys want to uh, get on a call with one of us, um, you know, reach out to me and uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be kind of connecting with you as well. And um, I'm sort of the point person for all that stuff. So um, myself or Mike, but, you know, the idea would be to, you know, get a, get us on a, a booking, uh, an expert call uh, to sort of discuss your 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 needs. And, and with that, um, I just want to say thank you to Kitty. Do, Kitty, do we have any other drinks to go through? Are we are we done? <laughs> I could, talk, I could talk about cocktails all day long, but that's all I have prepared for you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Great job. Yeah, yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for the, right. the partnership that we've had with Cocktail Guru. I'd also like to thank uh, Red Hat as well as uh, being a, uh, a sponsored partner with us and um, everybody else for taking time of their busy day to join us uh, for this. And hopefully you learned a little something. Hopefully uh, something clicked with you. And as Jonathan mentioned, you know, demos, uh, if you there's something in particular you would like to see functionality, you know, um, please reach out. We can, you know, help um, ease you through the process and get you where you guys want to be. So even if it's just a conversation. Thanks, all right. Everyone. Well, all right. With that, um, enjoy your evening and uh, if you're driving, drive responsible or call a cab. <laughs> yeah. so, St. Patrick's Day. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. All right. Cheers. Bye.